So, um, this is Mike, everybody. This is going to be a little bit of a strange one for me. I've known Mike for 20, 20 years. Say 10, we sound you man. Yeah, 20 years. Um, and unfortunately, we're not going to be able to talk about half the things I know about Mike um, until after curfew and maybe in a pub. But, um, so, but we're going to try and have a conversation around Mike's career in, in tech and digital gaming. So maybe, Mike, just, do you want to just briefly introduce yourself and what you're currently doing? And then once you've done that, we'll go back to the start. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Mike. I run a company called GameBrain, who make software as a service, serious games and apps. Um, I founded a game studio called Amuso and originally started running a web development company called 42. So that's a really good intro. It's almost like we know each other. Um, and that's a really good segue to where we start. But where I first met Mike, I didn't know Mike did 42 and, and did software development. I met Mike on a, we played football, we used to go out for beers when we were very young. Um, and then I got introduced to Mike as 42. And tell us, how did 42 start? Where did you, and even at that time, you were doing games of some description, weren't you? Do you want to just, how did you get into that? Okay, so there's a company three doors up called Unicorn Training uh, in the telephone building. Um, and out of university, I realized I needed a job because I needed some money. Um, and I went to work for Unicorn Training. So I did a year and a half with them. And at one point they asked me, can you please develop our website? So I looked up in a book what a website was. You're not gonna believe that. <laughs> uh, Cause yeah, who knew? Um, and learned how to code one. And convinced my friend Rob at university there to help me. So we built the Unicorn Training website. And wow, we were like, this web thing, that's really cool. This is going to be big. We should do websites. And they were producing CD-ROM based e-learning at the time. Um, so I went up to the owner uh, at the time and went, we should do these web things, not these CDs. And he says to me, we've got a roadmap. We've got a plan. We know where we're going. It's not for us, this web thing. However, here's your computer. Here's three months work. I can see you're passionate about it, go and do it. In other words, they really politely fired me. <laughs> um, so having done that, uh, my friend who originally built the website called Rob um, was a company called Key Designs first web developer based in Paul, um, now Red Web. Um, so he built them a content management system before we knew they were called content management systems. Uh, and we're, he was developing websites and I said we should, we should go for it, we should start our own business and try and be web developers. Uh, so off we went. Had no money, clearly. Uh, so first thing we did was blag an office. Uh, as a startup, money is the most important thing you've got because that's how you eat and breathe. So blag as much as you possibly can. So went and convinced someone who owned an office to give us a few desks there. And away we went, we started. Um, called it 42 because we wanted it to be numeric to go at the beginning of lists. We wanted it to be as short as possible. At that stage, you couldn't have two letter or two number domain names. Three was the smallest number. Uh, we wanted something cool we could make into a symbol. Uh, so, the answer to life, the universe, and everything is? 42. 42. Hence, all our servers are still called Marvin and various names of planets. Um, regretted that decision for uh, until we renamed the company, because I must have said, no, 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 you spell it number four, letter T, number two, <laughs> about 50,000 times. Um, but off we went. So, we got into our first office. Um, and the first thing you do when you start a business is quite clearly buy some business cards. And it's like, oh wow, I've got business cards, this is amazing. And 
very quickly realised we had no one to give them out to because we <coughs> had no idea what we were doing other than we could build websites. <laughs> um, so it turns out if you get elastic bands and fold business cards about four times into a little V, you could literally fire a business card into that hangry sign over there and it would really hurt. So for the first two years of our business, we mastered the art of firing business cards <laughs> at long distances. Um, at the same time, for some unknown reason, we, had, we were doing Pool Borough Council's website, we were doing Pool Tourism's website, we were doing West Wind Air Bearing's website. We were uh, doing some crazy things because we were going into these meetings and people, there, were, there was no competition. Uh, there was like no other web designers around, so away we were in and we got these contracts. So one, uh, I was taught by my uncle at that time uh, to not put my business title on a business card. So I had to get some more business cards after removing my job title, uh, which made more ammunition, which was fantastic, and went in because I look so young. So at 20 years old, and a young looking 20 years old, if I go and sit next to the MD of X, Y, and Z, or the mayor of Poole, or the this, that, and the other, and I've got MD on my business card, or they're just gonna laugh me out of the place. There's a lot of me getting laughed out of offices in this story, probably. <laughs> not, um, not just in offices, Mike. Not me. just in offices. Uh, so, that's how 42 started. We started building websites, and it was really, really good. And so, what, what year did you start? 1998. 1998. And, then, and so when did, you, when did you move into the V4 office in Westbourne? Because that wasn't your first office, was it? No, our no. first office was in Ferndale. Um, so a company called V4 went up to us, a chap called Chris Emmons, uh, and Sia Lou, uh, who runs... Can you I help me? I can't remember. Moose, no. dance, it's some, there's a moose involved. <laughs> An agency with a moose. There we go. Um, and we were developing computer animations for MCI Worldcom. MCI Worldcom are going to feature quite a lot yeah, of this we'll story. It, yeah. um, so, Worldcom were the seventh biggest company in the world. Uh, they did all the telecoms. They basically put the lines underneath the sea and ran the, the American connection, for want of a better word. Um, and it was working really well, and we were getting away with murder. We were charging them quite a lot of money for what we're doing, but they were absolutely loving it. Um, which, so everyone's winning. So Chris, on the extended, I need to black an office again, says, move in with us. I'll give you a free office. I'll give you a free Audi TT. Uh, make our office look bigger. Join our team, get a load of work. It'll be brilliant. By God, it was. And so when, uh, when was your first hire? So there was still you and Rob, wasn't there, so that, at that time? And then how soon after that? So I was still in the old office in Ferndown. Okay. Um, I think hiring people made us fire less elastic van business cards. Because uh, all of a sudden you've got to pay these people. Um, so there was a point where I'm, me and Rob uh, stood there and going, right, one of us has got to bring him work. We we're both coders, programmers, artists, and we said, well, one of us needs to do the sales then. So we tossed a coin, I lost, <laughs> and became the sales side of the organization. Um, and then we employed people and tried to sell more. And then how soon after that did you hire? And who um, was your first hire and why, why did you hire that person? I think his name was either Paul Angel or Joe Dollar um, because they were one of the few people who could code websites at the time, as simple as that. And they live local and we got on well with them, so hired first person. And then when did the game thing start? So I remember you guys when you had a, you had a CMS, although they weren't called CMSs then, and then these little games started, at the, I presume they were flash games, weren't they, if I remember rightly? That's right. Yeah, so these flash games started appearing, all based around driving cars around or moving people around. When, when, did, that, when did that sort of uh, appear and how did that come about? The first flash game we did, and it wasn't called Flash at the time, um, was for Hubba Bubba in 2000 for their website, and it was a 
bursting bubblegum chewing game thing. Um, so that was, well, no one else was making games at the time on the internet. Uh, so we thought, oh, this is kind of cool. Then we did. So did they just ask you? Did they just say, were you doing their website? Were you doing anything at all? How did the. No, my brother got a placement there. And he said, how can I make this pitch, this thing look better? And so Rob coded a, a flash game. I mean, I can't remember what it's called, Macromedia something or other. Um, uh, yeah, it was coded in action script, but um, I think it was Macromedia Shockwave. Shockwave, Shockwave yeah. that's it, yeah. Um, so, away we go, code, code the flash game. Uh, there were other people doing interactive stuff and things, but there certainly was no flash game industry. Um, built that, then we did a game for a racing car league, um, and the car game just just went mental. Yeah. It, were, it literally... Um, people were taking the car game and putting it on their own website and a, a game that started on one website was then on a gazillion websites, all making money from it by putting adverts around the side of it. Uh, so we allowed people to monetize their websites better. Yeah, so th realizing. this game, you basically steered the cars with your cursor keys around a track or two and you'd race three or four other people or eight people or whatever it was and you'd smash and it was... It was good, and so I mean, I remember playing that game in, 40, in V4 offices, probably rather too much, which is why it all went out of business. Um, but and so, what, what happened then? So, as a result of doing this game, did that suddenly change your mentality about what you're doing as an agency? Did, was there a, I mean, to be fair, there haven't been too many conscious decisions in your life, but it, was, was there like a bit of thought that thought actually we should you got probably that early, didn't you? <laughs> was there a thought that said actually? This game right. thing seems to... So what happened then was MSHA Worldcom. Okay. Um, so, we're both working for V4 at the time. I believe you're the managing director, Andy? Uh, I was directing something, yeah. Yeah. And um, we were working for pretty much every telecom. We were doing their presentations. We were making them really interactive. Uh, and we were very, very popular because people would employ us to make their internal presentation better than their rivals, they would get promoted, they would hire us again, and literally we help people go up the ladder in global organizations and organizing crazy things. So MCI Worldcom basically said, we don't want you working for our competition. Or oh, this is my memory of it. I like my, I'll go for mine. Yeah, you go for yours. Um, and we went out and we got ridiculously drunk because they put us basically on a retainer for an awful lot of money not to work with their competitors and it was brilliant. Two weeks later, seventh biggest company in the world no longer exists. Uh, them and Enron were doing that insider trading, moving money between one company and the other. I think it's called fraud. Fraud, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so we had signed a lovely contract saying we weren't going to work for the rest of their competition and they weren't technically bankrupt, they were just not spending any money. Um, so both me and Andy had this very delightful period of our lives where we were, I was living with V4 staff who weren't being paid. Um, my car was through V4 that wasn't being paid for. Uh, the office was V4s, which wasn't being paid for. Um, our computers and our side of it at 42 was still okay because it wasn't 100% of our business. Um, but we were having almost to stay late at night to make sure if people came to take the computers, take the desks, they didn't take ours. Um, so we moved office. Bye, Andy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And, and that was the... But by that time, you'd recruited Kay. Yeah, we were on You'd recruited about Lewis. So how many, but you were more than that, you were eight, six, nine, eight. Something so like that. Let's talk a little bit about that little period there in terms of... So this is when the games kicked in. Yeah. So moving office, all of a sudden we're like, oh, blimey, what do we do? What, what are we good at? We were also going to website meetings at the time to find... We went to Bath Travel to try and pitch for their website. And Bath Travel said to us, oh yeah, pitching against two other people. These other two companies only make travel agent websites. Okay. Um, so we realized that we had lost our little niche. Um, we weren't big enough to compete with the big boys. 
Um, so we looked at what else we were doing. We were doing these flash games for all sorts of different companies by that stage. Um, I think we'd started working for Toonatic, um, which is Saturday, Sunday morning TV on ITV with Jamie and Anna. Um, boys versus girls games between the cartoons living in a crazy attic. And yeah, it was going really well. We we're selling games to medical companies, to Sigma Aldrich, we we're selling them to Vauxhall, we we're selling them to all sorts of different people. So we thought, do you think you can get away with making a get company that does flash games? And li I can literally remember the conversation because I was the only one who believed you could. Um, and everyone else was going, don't be stupid, Mike. That's no, no, the websites are retainers and blah, blah. Um, whether it was a good decision or a bad decision, we made that decision and convinced people that that's the way we should go. Um, and Rob was making some of the world's greatest flash games at the time. He was genius at it. Um, so, because so, in effect, oh, sorry, I'm going to turn this off. So, but hadn't he built in effect almost like a, a CMS for games? So you sort of weren't developing them from scratch all the time, were you? you were, yeah, you were, we were. We pretty much were. Were you? Okay. Well, you covered that well. So, so the, but a lot of them were quite similar, weren't you? You seemed to me to do a really good job of reselling, of presenting, selling the same game to lots of different people with slightly different coloured cars and a slightly different. Yeah. Track in, yeah. the, in the nicest possible way. You seem you really explored well, that. Well, the best companies in the world who make games make one game, make one genre of game, and reskin it and make it slightly differently. Look at TT Games and all the Lego mm. console games. Pretty much one game, just constantly refining the mechanics. If I, if anyone here is looking at creating a game studio, focus on one game genre. Be good at one game genre. Uh, people will know you for that and things. So yeah, we reskinned as much as we could, mm. but we we're making. Hyper casual games before hyper casual games had a name. Yeah. Pick up and play, spend two minutes on it, come back again and again. Flash games for tele companies by that stage. And, and so the next big change that I recall for you guys was when, and the thing that seemed to take you to another level was when you got involved with Lego. Yeah. So, so what, when was that and how did that come about? Okay. 2006, so that by that stage we were doing flash games for pretty much every TV station in, in the UK. On a Saturday morning, if you got lucky or unlucky, you could go from BBC One playing a flash game to BBC Two playing a flash game to ITV playing a flash game and very, very occasionally Channel Four and we would have made those flash games um, or some of them. So from there we went to did some work for Disney, we did some work for all, all the media organisations because they understood that kids would come back to interactive cool content, sticky content they used to call it. Um, so they realised flash games were monetizable or the good thing before anyone else. Um, so at that stage I thought, right, how do we get more clients? So I'll go and do a talk. So top tip number one maybe, only top tip coming out. Um, figure out what you're good at, join a trade association for it. Um, so being a member of Lima, the licensing association, still member of Tiger, uh, the computer game one. Uh, so this was for Lima, and my sole thing on joining Lima was, but I want to be up on stage. I want to be up on stage talking to people because I haven't got the manpower, the money, the persistence to go and talk to a thousand different people individually. I need to talk to as many people as possible all at once in a presentation and the two or three people that believe me, brilliant. I don't want to spend all my time talking to 997 people who don't. Um, so I did a talk about how to make chairs and tables exciting because if I can make chairs and tables exciting I can make anything exciting. Um, and I was going on tour for something called Business Link at the time, uh, doing this talk, so I practiced it quite well and knew how to pull the stunts. Room like this, about 500 people in. I pulled two wheelie chairs out and like, this is how you make chairs fun, and I ran a race between two people on the wheelie chairs going around the audience. And in the corners of the room, I had people with party poppers, silly string, water cannons, you name it. So by the time the people zoomed past on the wheelie chairs, they got back to the start and they looked like trifles. Um, so I picked two people out of the crowd and 
got lucky. Um, by lucky, I mean I put myself in the position to be lucky, which I think is a really big difference between what some people think is luck and you've got to be there, you've got to be saying it to have the opportunity for these things to happen. Um, one of the person people I pulled out of the crowd is the head of Lego Marketing at random doing something for learning about licensing because he thought he might be able to license a few things. Lego, fancy that. <laughs> uh, met him afterwards and he went, okay, that's fantastic. Can you please come to Denmark? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> um, went to Denmark and here's my second piece of luck. The person who I met then called Brent Hill um, was brand new to his job from Microsoft. One of four people doing games at Lego. Um, and he said, Mike, I really want to make a splash. I, I want to own this bit. Um, so all I did for Brett, in the nicest possible way, is write his manifesto and prepare his pitches for his global domination of Lego. Um, because if I did it that way, I knew I could push his boundaries, which helped get both me where I needed to be and him where he wanted to be. And wow, we did a, he did. Well. So we started with Aquaraders, which was a category C Lego product, I think, which means it's there for a year um, <coughs> and then it goes. Um, great game. I can always remember one of the things Brett, Brent did to get everyone at Lego knowing about what he did, which to this day, I, just brilliant. Uh, Fish Finger Friday. Everyone likes fish fingers. Um, so to launch his game internally, just to let everyone at Lego know about his game, he stood um, by the corner of the canteen and gave everyone who walked past, every Lego staff member said, do you want a free fish finger? Have a sticker, go play my game. Of course, everyone at Lego is talking about it. Um, that goes into Lego City with a lovely lady called Leia, who is a fantastic person to work with. Um, more stories about her later. Um, from there we did Barnacle, a Star Wars story, we'll get into that later too. Uh, and it's just 12, so, 12 years now I've worked with Lego. So you, and you're still working with them now, aren't you? Is it? Yeah. And, and so over that period, how many games have you produced for Lego, built for Lego, roughly? 60. 60, okay. And, and how many of those have been number one in how many countries? And um, so what sort of, can you give a feel for what we talk about in terms of downloads and number ones and stuff like that? Could you give people a bit of insight into that? Uh, so it's like the Premiership. Nothing, there's no football history before the Premier League started. There's no real stats on games before apps started. There are, I can tell you about them, but no one cares or understands. Um, so app-wise, we've built 19 or 18 games for Lego, or had 18 number one games for Lego. So they've hit number one in some country, normally on iPad, because kids use iPads more than iPhones, so their iPad figures are much better than their iPhone figures. Um, in a category on the App Store. So the best category to get number one is obviously overall. That means you're above Facebook or whatever the biggest apps of the day are. So the biggest, the best credit you can ever say is I'm number one overall in America. And we achieved that with Lego four times. And so what tool, is that over a period of a, a day, a week, a month, what sort of? Uh, getting number one could be, a, a, is a day, but could last a week, a yeah. month, a, for as long as it lasts. And so what sort of numbers of downloads are we, are we talking about? Just trying to think what I can say here, because you can uh, you can check on the App Store for chart position of apps. Yeah. You can't check for download Demons. figures. Yeah, yeah. But if I tell you five year old figures, then that's not going to matter. Um, a good game was pulling in twenty five million downloads, and our total overall plays for those apps was well over three billion. <whistles> so here's a good one: uh, three billion app sessions. Our average app session was say seven minutes. You could walk to a planet and back in the time if you played all those games back to back. Can anyone guess that what that planet is? Pluto. Pluto? No, carry on. Jupiter? No. 
Keep naming planets. Come on. It's your, when, when you shout it out aloud, you'll know. Thank you very much to that man over there. It's just a cheap stunt to make someone shout Uranus. Uh, but Uranus is the answer. Uh, you could literally walk Uranus about playing those games if you somehow could walk in space. And, and so were you, were you still, when you, when you first started to be Lego and you know 12 or 18, you, you weren't still eight people. Had you recruited more or did you, Probably how did the team grow? What was 15 to 20 people by that stage. Okay. And then, and that's the offices in Westbourne? Uh, yeah, that was the offices. No, we probably moved into... Oh, moved into Bournemouth. Then. Yeah, Bournemouth yeah. by then. So, so what sort of... What were some of the challenges with growing the team? I mean, where was all the skill? Was all the skill in the... Was it the games developers? Was it designers? Was it artists? Was it... What sort of skill set did you have? And how did you find the people? Because that's not... It's quite a difficult skill set to find, I would imagine. Especially if you decide to open a game studio in a town with no other game studios. Yeah, um, where we found the people is we either got them out of university so they're super talented or we convinced people to move their families to Bournemouth because they didn't want to be in the city etc anymore and Bournemouth's a fantastic place to live. So we had a kind of rift in the middle age group um, but they were normally flash game people or spectrum game people or people of that nature coded games and then we figured out together how to do apps. So there is a funny story about Lego that I want to talk about briefly. So you broke some limb, which you do quite regularly, didn't you? And good um, yeah, so I've been on skiing holidays with Mike with his broken two legs, I think. Um, it was his fault, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> um, but you were, you'd broken some limb or other, and, and you were laid up in bed. And so what did you, what did you decide to do? I decided to build a Carillion light freighter model YT110 or 13. Which was a Lego kit, wasn't it? It was a Millennium Falcon. Millennium Falcon. And, and when did they give you that Millennium Falcon? Uh, when we got our first Lego Star Wars game. So what year was that? Uh, roughly 2007. And then, and then you, you broke your limb, was it six, seven, or this one, that's, was it six years later, seven years later? Yeah, so the that? model was so big, uh, and it would have taken up our entire office, and they were all grey bricks, that we didn't open it, because we are like, this will take up our office for four or five months, because we've built all these Lego models, we know how long they take. So we put it in the loft. Seven years later, I break my leg, and I get the Lego model out, and my wife at that stage had Literally, God, right, Mike, you're such a pain in the ass right now. I'm going on holiday for a couple of weeks. Um, I took my daughter with her because I must have been a miserable, grumpy person with a broken leg. Uh, so well, what can I do? What can I do? I'll build the Millennium Falcon. So there was a Star Wars Next Generation weekend on um, and the Millennium Falcon. So I fully geeked up and started building it and tweeted my friends in Lego, yay, I'm building Falcon. So they get a tweet back for them saying, you idiot, that was worth $10,000 before you opened the box. So obviously you didn't know that at the time, did you? <laughs> Oops. Oops. Anyway, it uh, saved my sanity now. I had a good time building it. Good. But so, with all these downloads and with all the, uh, with all the success that you're having with the games, do you, do you feel that you maximise the opportunity there? Um, we were doing marketing games um, and we got BAFTA nominated for it and we won every marketing award going. Uh, but if we had the financial clout and backing, we would have been making monetized games. Um, but we didn't, so we couldn't. Um, therefore, that we did what we could do within that range and did it as best as we could. So yeah, it'd be great to say we launched monetized games there because yeah, we probably made a fortune. Mm. But it wasn't. We hadn't borrowed money. We hadn't got. So we mm. couldn't do that. And, and so by that time, Robert now moved to Canada, hadn't he? Yeah. Robert Canada. Okay. Um, and then, is it fair to say it, it got a bit rocky? Um, yeah, so Rob decided 
for his own reasons that uh, Canada is the place for me. Uh, I've got to, I want to grow up in Canada. I want to become a, a logger, what you call those people who chop down trees in. Lumberjack. I think that, I don't think he was serious about this, but uh, I want to change my lifestyle, I've done this too. This is before, it's just, a, just after our first Lego game. Um, so, fair enough. Good luck, off you go. Hired someone to replace him. Um, and then about a year later decided that he wanted some money again, because the exchange rate slightly changed or, but so wanted to work with us. And to be honest, Rob coming back and saying, I want to do some more flash games with you is like, brilliant, fantastic. Um, but yeah, it caused a little bit of chaos because we had our own team. He's seven hours out on timelines. Um, and being Rob, he was absolutely technically correct on every single decision he wanted to make, but what wasn't there to deliver in person to manage the impact of saying, no, that's wrong. And, uh, so it caused us a bit of a headache and in the end Rob wanted to leave uh, and he wanted us to buy his shares and we couldn't afford his shares um, at the price he wanted for them. So he made every possible move he could to try and sell his shares. He made his decisions and his motivations at that time were buy my shares and yeah, it was a painful experience. And so how did you resolve that and did, did that so one of the common themes that we've had in, in recent weeks at, at these chats has been around founder alignment. So, you know, when you start a company, you need to make sure that the people that you're working with are on the same page and you're going in the same direction. Um, and then, so it's good to talk to somebody where at some point in time there's been a bit of founder misalignment. So what impact, did, if any, did that have on the team? Did the team know about this that, that, that you're working with? Was it visible? Was it... And how did you resolve it? What, what sort of happened? Yeah, it couldn't not be visible because it put us in positions we didn't want to be in. Um, he launched a 42 brand in Canada, for example. Um, he's a very clever person, Rob. I mean, very clever. So he managed to get himself 257,000 Twitter followers under a 42 Twitter account by building himself an engine to do retweeting stuff. Um, so yeah that's like whoa what's this over here in canada going on um how did we resolve it someone bought shares he got what he wanted so we found someone to buy shares that's the only way we could have resolved it um we could have sat there and not listened for a lot um i put a link on the will it be no let me get this right uh on my linkedin if you follow have a look on me and go to uh, the, my recent things, there's a post by Willoughby Stewart, Marcus, uh, a lawyer, on how, what you should do to, when you're creating a startup, which is make sure your paperwork's all good at the beginning, which ours was. Um, and I can remember going up to him and he literally sat me down and this is a lawyer, he goes, right Mike, start again. Just don't, just this, making your life miserable, just don't, don't stomach this, just start again. Um, but was that, that must have been a tough piece of advice to, to hear. Yeah, so it was. And also because I was Rob's best man. So it's like, yeah, he may be causing me grief and hassle, but I can understand the logic of why he's doing it. He wants to sell shares. <laughs> um, so we went through that period. It was tricky. We got over it. We moved past it. He got lots of money for his shares. He's very happy. And so who did you sell the shares to? Can you say who that was or is that a... Company? Yeah, you know the person who politely fired me? The unicorn company? <laughs> That'll teach him. <laughs> <laughs> but this is where it starts to come a bit back full circle, isn't it? In that you then got started to get involved with unicorn a little bit. Yeah, so I think there's some important things at Lego to, to learn yeah, yeah. from, from startup on the way and the app journey. Um, so we made Lego Splash games on the website. They were really popular. Um, but it was shooting fish in a barrel. If you visited Lego's website, you were playing their flash games. That's what you did. Um, so we wanted to reach new people. Um, we had just won the New Media Age, if anyone can remember that, you're showing your age, uh, awards. We won the best consumer marketing campaign and, and the overall show award. Um, so that Lego trusted us, trusted our judgment, BAFTA nominated for Best Independent Production Studio at the same time. 
Um, and they, what we said, we want to build an app. And they went, oh, an iPhone game. I went, yeah, okay, an iPhone game. Um, so they wanted us to do something digitally on an app the year before, but A, we weren't ready for it, and B, they're, they're, neither were they, and so we knew that that was a dead end. Um, so a year later, though, we said, right, it's time to build an app. So we went up to them and said, yeah, let's do it. Um, and they said, okay, but we've got Lego.com. Why do we want to build apps that's got all this traffic? And I ended up sat down in a meeting with all the different heads of uh, marketing for Lego for all the different brands um, and talked to them about building apps. And they had the head of web marketing, the head of www, the head of .com, the head of and no one in the mobile seat because it didn't exist then. Um, and they trusted us because we're delivering good results and went for it and they gave us one of their brands and said, right, deliver it as an app. Um, so standing in front of all those people was terrifying. And we didn't really know if we could develop apps. We'd not done it before. But every single startup has to say yes and then solve how they're going to do it a lot, all the time. Um, so you go for it, you say yes. Uh, we delivered the app and it worked. It worked fantastically. We got 400% more traffic to the game, 300% uh, better retention literally overnight. Uh, a long time ago, so it's safe to say now, their apps were getting played 28 times more than their web games. Um, so overnight, uh, millions of plays became billions of plays. Hmm. And wow, what a difference. It was just amazing. Um, and then came a different Lego brand, so um, a Lego brand that hadn't been done before or for a while, I can't really explain why because the person will figure out that I'm talking about them, that's a bit mean uh, because it's a lovely compliment to this person um, but we'd worked with them a lot uh, and they trusted us uh, but this brand was slightly outside our normal experience uh, so we pitched uh, they rang up uh, and we'd worked really hard on this pitch uh, and they said sorry Mike you haven't got it and I was like oh sorry um, and I think my own the one thing I'm most proud of in my entire business career is what I did then I said oh, sorry I, I, can't, I think you've made the wrong decision uh, and I talked to her for five minutes um, and got to change my mind in that conversation and won the contract that, yeah, properly helped put us on the map. Um, I've never done it since, I don't think, as in literally being told no and then st literally sit on the phone going, like, seriously, we put this much effort and here's why it works. This is, um, but yeah, sometimes you just, realised that's what you meant to do at the right time. And was that just, just because, well not just because, but you, you truly believed in what you were doing? What, what was the motivating there? Was you just... Absolutely believed in what we're doing and had built a really, really good team in order to do it. Uh, and I was, about, I was feeling gutted about this team we put together to, to do it. I was like, no, these people are really good. So again, again there's another, another common thread that comes through from, from a lot of the chats. Um, and, and that's just about belief. So one of the things that have always struck with you is you have complete and utter belief in what you're doing is right and the best way to do it. And, but have you ever gone through a period of doubt where you thought, actually, I don't, I, this isn't right, this isn't working, this isn't... Does it feel like... Or have you literally just had that steadfast belief all the way? Yeah, every night. Every night. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny, that, that's such a common thread with the people that we talk about, all of who start their own business and become successful there is that inherent keep going keep believing don't ever stop if the doubt's there it's there for probably a millisecond or a minute or whatever it is but it goes away and then you're back on that belief for it aren't you um i i think one of the words that i would describe that's really important in a startup uh that most people consider a negative is arrogance Arrogance in a good way, to just be able to take 
that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, and plough through it. And just go, no, I'm right. Because if you tell enough people your story, someone will believe you're right. Um, and some people will think you're being arrogant. I can only describe it. I, that's the, <laughs> the people who say no think, oh, arrogant idiot. The people who say yes are the people you want to work with. Um, and just having that perseverance is a, another key word. Uh, just bang, 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 keep going. Keep saying those words. Even if you've got doubts, never surface them to other people. Um, if at all you possibly can, I surface some of them to our staff sometimes and I know I shouldn't do it. Um, you've got to believe in what you're doing because no one else will believe for you. Not a single person outside of your team will believe you're doing the right thing. Um, that everyone you ask will say, no, that's stupid, don't do that. Why do you do that? That doesn't work that way. It works this way all the time. Why would we change things? Yeah, that's what startups do. Startups go in there and smash that idea up and do something different and change the world. Uh, and that's why they're so important and cool to work for. And sometimes you make the wrong decisions and sometimes you're on the wrong end of an argument and you kind of know you are. But by simply talking it through and explaining your thoughts, some people will maybe slightly correct you and away you go, kind of thing. Just tweak what you're saying. Uh, but the people who've no interest and are firmly against you identified those and brilliant. Some of them, a salesperson can turn into brilliant sales uh, because you. Th I, I sell on negative. I say, no, that's wrong. So if you asked me, if you said, Mike, sell me this glass bottle, I couldn't do it. Would not, no way, couldn't do it. Because that's what you want. I go in and say, no, you don't want a glass bottle. What you need is a pair of glasses and then explain the logic in my thought. Because there are 20 companies, all capable of building and selling that glass bottle, and no one else is saying, no, that's the wrong solution, you need a pair of glasses. Um, and that's why we win pitches, because we, there are certain pitches and certain people and certain countries you can do that in. Okay, and that, that segues nicely into a little bit more up-to-date stuff, because what, what happened then was that you, with a connection with the unicorn, you started to get, um, again, from an outside-in perspective, a little bit more into, or a lot more, into using games in a business sense for, for learning, didn't you? And so how did that, again, where, where did that come from? Where, where was the initial spark for the idea? Was it a customer, was it a unicorn? No, it's, it's literally a unicorn. Um, so they said, Mike, we bought in, we really like what you're doing, we're not doing apps. No one really does apps in our space. Uh, we love gamification, we love games, can you work with us to do this? And we started doing it with our existing team. So basically they were developing Ninjago games one minute and then learning games the next. And we very soon realised that it didn't mix. You either like the learning games and the productized side uh, and the, the sort of clearer roadmap or you wanted to do games and that's why you're in the industry. Um, and that was a, a tough thing that we went through trying to figure this out. So now we've started Game Brain, where we've taken the people who want to do the serious games, the productization, the, the opportunity to go software as a service and make lots of money um, away from the people who want to develop games. So Muzo for games, they're creating a film IP at the moment and another fantastic, amazing license they've won. Um, a little bit more of a lottery ticket if you hit it big, you're going to smash it out of the park. Um, and they're superbly talented, passionate people. And my team are now looking at the serious games because we just see opportunity there. There's a brilliant opportunity to say, no, no, you need glasses, not beer bottles. And so, and presumably the, the beer bottles that you're talking about, what would that be in this case? Would it be an LMS or would it, would it be a learning management system? What, what's, the, what's the beer bottle? Boring learning. Boring learning, okay. Um, so the stuff that you sit down and do and it takes you half an hour to go through, uh, no one uses their phone for a half hour period. You use it for a couple of minutes uh, a lot of times or you use it a couple of minutes, get addicted and sit there carrying on playing. Uh, normal, traditional, interactive learning, you sit down and you do over a period of time sat in front of a computer. That's just not the way people work anymore. 
um, and especially millennials and people younger, you go into, we're doing tons of work with automotive um, because the mechanics and people like that, and in the lunch break, they've got the phone out. That, so that, those are the people, that's the way we want to engage with and be educated and it's moments of need. And to be able to make learning fun, the feedback we got from Jaguar uh, from all their people doing their games is just astonishing. They're like, oh my God, learning can be fun. It's brilliant. It's awesome. It's why isn't all on a link like this? So, so who, are, who, are the some of, uh, who are some of the customers that you're working with now at Game Brain? L let's do, which ones can you talk about on the video? Uh, on the video then. Okay, I can say we're working with Jaguar Land Rover, uh, the RNLI, um, I'm meeting delivery on Wednesday in the Conservative Party on Wednesday. Um, we're uh, Axo Noble, who all the, own all the paint companies, Morrison's, a selection of brands you'll have heard of, PSA, Citron, Vauxhall, DS. And so these are all guys that are people that have bought into buying the glasses rather than buying the beer Buy bottle? Them. Yeah. Okay. And, and who are some of the people that uh, you can't talk about on video that so we're going to cut out? Okay, cool. So we can cut that bit out. That's absolutely fine. Thank you. I'll let Omar Benioff will see you very quickly. Um, and so that sort of brings us up to date. I saw today that you've been at a um, learning show. Uh, and how did, how did that go? I saw the unicorns. So what was the response to the glasses rather than the beer bottles? Yeah. Karen, what was the response to the glasses, not the beer bottles? So it was a good show. We got a queue of 10 to 20 people all wanting to play the game for two days consistently. The game was played a thousand times. It takes a minute and that's basically longer in time because we only had one iPad because we wanted to build a queue of people like a cheap nightclub stunt. <laughs> it worked. Uh, we had teddy bear unicorns uh, that people could win and oh my God, the sales leads we got for it looked like the stock exchange is just the list of every, the world's biggest companies. And, and so what, what's, the, what's the future for, for Mike and for Game Brain? Where do you think you, you're going with it? So, so how many people is, you, is, does it feel like you're doing another startup? I am doing another startup, literally. Uh, so we sign the papers or if they're signed, I am now a new company as opposed to a muso, so we're formally separated. Um, granted, it's cheating because I've financially backed by Unicorn now. Um, so I don't need to worry quite so much about free offices and things like that. Um, so this time around, we can do it properly and take advantage of all the opportunities that are out there and not have to shortcut around it because we've not got the funding. And so, so how many people are you at Game Brain now? How uh, many people are here? Are they, are they all here? Yeah, is it 20, here, yeah. 25, is it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, on top of my head, six. Okay, and what, where think, do you... I put it, we've not counted yet, we've not okay. got to that stage. So, so one, so... two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and a few people at a part, a muso part, Gambra. Okay, and so what's the pl where do you think you'll be this time next year? Uh, celebrating with the most awesome team I've worked with for ages. Of how many people? Uh, uh, we'll be 12 people by the end of this year as a goal, mm. and then take stock of it then and see where we go. Yeah. Okay, cool. Alrighty, so does anybody have any questions for Mike? Um, yeah, ton of it. Uh, so follow that link on LinkedIn, uh, go and see Marcus, uh, the lawyers, and get your paperwork sorted. Uh, right at the very beginning, it's, you can't do it later. Later is too late, too complicated, absolute nightmare. Sign it all at the beginning when everyone's best of friends and everyone's pointing in the same direction because it means it's easier to stay friends because you've got set groundwork. If you try and do it later, it's a nightmare. Um, so that's number one. Number two, say yes. Say yes a lot. Uh, you can't do it. You don't know how to do it. Not being able to do something is a, I said this a lot today, a who problem, not a how problem and you want who problems. Who problems, you hire someone who can do it. How problems are, ooh. So entrepreneurs look for who problems, or 
are who opportunities. So who can I get to do this? Uh, delegating is the hardest thing you'll ever do, ever, uh, because it's so hard to let go of things, and you need your team to be going their own way and doing their own thing and pushing it. Uh, so that's the hardest thing. But if you don't succeed in doing it, you're you're stuffed. Um, and find your niche. So I can remember. Do you remember Lyndon Stickley from Emcorp? <laughs> so I still see Lyndon a lot. I'll get a mentor. Um, uh, Lyndon gave me a talk once about. He looked at our website menu and we did games, websites, virtual press offices. It was like Chinese menu of things. And he said, focus on being the world's greatest ping pong player. You're not Daley Thompson. You can't be a decathlete. You've not got the funds. Just be good at something and boss that thing. Um, so that would be my top tips, I think. Um, and then spend as much time as you can with your team. They're going to make it work. You can't do it on your own, and you want to make sure they're invested in the same success for you equals success for them in every way possible. So, what can you do to make their lives easier? It's hard work, don't expect any sleep. Um, no, because VR at the moment for game games. Uh, doesn't have that big a market, especially on mobile. Um, for marketing games, you're trying to get to your biggest audience possible all the time, and your biggest audience possible doesn't own a VR headset. Um, so that rules out marketing games in VR. Uh, then you've got the monetized games that they're really focused on now. Monetized games don't have the biggest market, so you'd have to niche and hammer into that. The advantages of VR and AR are the available funds. So if you wanted to do a startup, ah, free money. That's the best bit of advice. So chase down all the free money you can as a startup. Um, go and talk to Silicon South and all the other people who know where that money is. Um, the industrial strategy, read the industrial strategy document, understand what that means. The government put it out. That's where all the money is. That's where all the grants are. There were staggering grants for AR and VR stuff last year, and there will be this year, because the UK is one of X many things that they want the UK to run and boss. Therefore, they've got, they're putting money into it, left, right, and center, so free money to grab. Uh, we've grabbed three funds in the past, 50K a time probably for various ventures. There's nothing better than a chunk of money that doesn't come with a client obligation that you can put into your product. And it's easy to get. Honestly, staggeringly easy to get if you try and you're passionate and you know your stuff. Um, I wish we were big enough to have a regimented training schedule. Uh, or I, we've never got that regimented. Uh, so a lot of self-teaching. Um, a lot of hiring people with specific skills and realizing where we're weak at certain things. Um, that we offer whatever training people want to do, but to be honest, we're normally roadmapped to know where we're going in a direction, so let's dive in, figure out how to do it. Because even when, the minute you're going on a course for tech, it's way out of date. Absolutely way out of date. So it's almost pointless. Um, so if we like, how do you build an app when there's no apps out there? Where'd you go? Uh, good software. So there's two ways to go making games. You build your own game engine or you use an existing game engine. So Unity is an existing game engine, Unreal, or lots of the others have built their own game engines. That A costs a lot of money and it does lead to great success. Um, but we went the simple way, we went the tools way because we can't afford the super, super, super coders that can build game engines. Um, so it all depends what kind of, there's various ways of doing it. Um, so the recent game, Muso one, they created a demo, a really good demo, and showed it as many people as possible until someone said yes. Um, so that was a full on prototype. 
Uh, we can create light prototypes, so very quick iteration games in a week kind of thing, and try and find one that's good. Yeah. Um, for sales pitches, it's smoke and mirror decks, PDFs, pretty pictures. Uh, so we've got a person called Martin and Rich over here that make our presentations just look amazing and a good, pretty presentation. Not many words on visual and powerful wins over everything. Um, my best presentation uh, was for a £50,000 fund for Creative England. Um, I had four props with me. I bought in a hamster wheel. Uh, and through the things that I can't even remember. And I spent the first 20 seconds deliberately OCD, straightening them up on the table in front of them. Head of electronic arts, head of whatever. Um, and, and they went, oh, are you going to start your presentation, Mike? And I went, yep. I went, we're going to work harder than any other people in that room who are pitching for this thing. Any questions? And I'm on the train on the way up there, I was bricking it. I was like, can I really do this? That's so stupid. Well, this is an idiot's plan. You've got half an hour to explain your game to them. And I did it in one line. And I didn't even mention the game. Uh, and they went, okay. Why have you bought a hamster wheel? Because you couldn't not ask that question, could you? So I just spent 20 seconds putting a hamster wheel. Why have you bought a hamster wheel? And I went, because that's the hamster wheel we're stuck on. At the moment, we're building our own games. They're doing fantastically, working with people like Lego. But I can't get off it because to pay the wages, I need to get another game in. What we need to do is create our own IP and monetize that and branch out of that and get off this hamster wheel. That's why I bought a hamster wheel for you. And then explain the other things. And during that process of obvious, I baited the questions to match the game. They asked me the questions that I wanted them to ask. And we got 50 grand. So when I say it's easy to get 50 grand, it's either crazy easy or you need to be a complete freak. <laughs> Slight insight into Mike there. <laughs> 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 Any other, I've seen a couple of Mike's um, presentations and if you, uh, in terms of talks and stuff, uh, this is very calm. So if you do get a chance, I would recommend seeing Mike um, do something crazy on stage. It's, it's quite a show. Uh, yes, sir. Yeah. Um, when we had no money, presentations, so talks, sign up to every talk you can possibly give, pick something that is divisive uh, and have a strong opinion. Don't doesn't matter which way your strong opinion is oriented in, just give out that opinion. Flash is dead, go unity, whatever that thing is. Um, some people will listen, some people won't. People will listen and you'll get leads from and things like that. Don't be shy. The biggest hindrance for any entrepreneur, in my opinion, and certainly the ones I know, shyness kills you. If you've got an opportunity to talk to someone, talk to them. Uh, best example I can give you of one I didn't do when I was at university because I hadn't learned this yes and that. Went to a talk on computer animation and we had silicon graphic machines at the uni. And uh, we were one of the few places that did. And we went to a conference and at the end of it, I managed to get talking to the head of some amazing computer animation company. Uh, and he's there going, oh, this is fantastic. And he's about to intro me to literally the head of ILM or something ridiculous. Said, oh, this is a student that knows silicon graphic machines. You're looking for one of them. And the bus was leaving. <laughs> so everyone else is literally going to the bus and they're like, Mike, Mike, the bus, bus. What I should have done is say, I'll get a taxi back, I'll get a train back, I'll walk back, yeah. piss off. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> go away. Um, I, I, this is more important. Um, and yeah, you just got to, got to grab that opportunity when you can. But thank you, Mike. That brings us to about time. Um, an amazing chat, brilliant presentation, although it was a presentation, but just do go and see Mike on stage if you get a chance, it is a sight to behold. Um, great learning points, Mike's gonna hang around. If you've got any questions, feel free to interrupt him. Stand generally somewhere where you can't be pushed into anything, it would be my 
final word of advice. But um, thank you, sir. Thank you very much indeed. It's my pleasure, and thank you very much for letting me speak at Startup Grand. And Marcus, for all his massive, massive help on the PR and the social stuff. There we go. Cheers, Mike. Thank you.